We will move on to number five, and I would be seeking um, um, the fine arts standards revision. I, I would be seeking a motion concerning the fine arts standards revision. I don't want to direct that. Go I ahead. I move that the board recommends the fine arts standards begins a standards revision standards revision process. I need a second. I second. We don't need it. That's why that. The oh, I, I'd like to speak to my motion. <laughs> but we did have a second from board member Booth. And why are we saying we don't need this? It, it, Go ahead. Maybe I have a question, Chair, if that's appropriate. Yes. I, I actually thought I read that like 85% in the field did not feel we needed to move forward this particular year on fine art standards, so I think I made the wrong motion. Uh, yeah. can, okay. I, can I make a friendly amendment to my motion? Uh, um, you can't, but someone else could. I maybe, could friendly maybe change Maybe Board my Member motion. Earl would like to make a, a different... I would like to amend the motion. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, not, to, to does to, not recommend. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a second to that friendly? amendment? Second. Second. second, board member Booth. Okay, so the the uh, rec the the motion the amendment is to change recommend to does not recommend. All in favor of that uh, amendment? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so now the motion is, is that the board does not recommend the fine art standards be, begin the standards revision process. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Okay, well that was easy, Jennifer. There we go. Oh, board member Cannon, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, I just, you didn't ask for discussion. I'm I sorry. just wanted to point out something that um, I, as I was reading this, uh, really touched me and it said uh, they, uh, the teachers, when they had comments that most wanted more music to be available to them in their teaching, and they wanted uh, music instruction in for fine arts in the elementary schools, and uh, they want the secondary teachers want options and availability of arts courses, especially music. And so I think as a board, it's important for us to recognize that the people in the field are asking and and requesting of us that there's more music availability in our schools for our kids. Thanks. Thank you, board member Ken. I'm sure board member Booth would agree. Okay, we'll move on to number six. Um, Scott, the monthly budget report, please. I should say deputy superintendent of operations. Oh, and Deborah Jacobson. And Assistant Super, or, uh, and Deputy Superintendent Stallings. Stallings please, is coming too. Okay, yes. thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, good morning, uh, board members, uh, members of the public. Uh, Scott Jones, Deputy Superintendent of Operations. Uh, this is your monthly budget report. Uh, the report, as you know, we've just started uh, uh, and we're into, well into the next fiscal year, which is fiscal year 20. Three? Yeah, 23. So um, July, August, and September, uh, since it's your September meeting, um, you're looking at your July um, 31st. Yeah, do we? We just want to make sure we can pull it up for you so we can make it public facing. Um, each month, uh, by way of the Money Management Act and the Budgetary Procedures Act, or by law, I'm required to inform you or attest to the ability for the Utah State Board of Education to meet all of its commitments and obligations. Um, we are still in position uh, to do so. However, uh, we recently discovered a situation specific to one particular line item or piece of appropriation related to the statewide online education program. Uh, we were appropriated six, a uh, little bit more than, a little bit more than six hundred thousand dollars. And Director Franzen is here to elaborate further on that. Uh, we uh, invoked a rule, wrote the rule. There was some questions or concerns. Enrollment, as enrollment came in, uh, due to our internal controls and the great uh, attentive details that 
or attention to detail that our staff provides, they discovered that there was some potential misinterpretation of the rule and the enrollments uh, currently exceed that um, allocation or that, that appropriation of just, again, a little bit over $600,000. So with that, we made a request uh, to the board chairs to make you aware of this and asked if you would consider uh, amending the rule that you see in front of you. So at this time, uh, Chair Belknap, in the interest of our fiduciary responsibility, uh, will you please call on Deputy, Deputy Superintendent Stallings uh, to further um, develop the rule with, with the board? Go ahead. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, Angie Stallings, Deputy Superintendent of Policy, or USBE. Um, one, uh, Deputy Jones covered it very well. We, um, our teaching and learning staff, SOEP staff, brought this to our attention that the language could use some clarification. So you'll notice that there's actually a draft two that's uploaded. Uh, we added public high, those two words, yesterday because to match the statute. Um, this is related to last year's H, or I'm sorry, uh, 2022 HB 417. This is, that was the bill that provided um, an appropriation and stated that schools with less than 1,000 students could receive some state funding to offset the cost of the funds that go to um, the SOEP providers. And when we, yesterday when we were reviewing this with some stakeholders, they um, reminded us that it really only applies to high schools. So we added that reference to high schools in the rule as well. So um, when and if you are ready to make a motion to just please make sure that it's draft two instead of draft one. Uh, if you have any questions about the actual language, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, we also have Director Jennifer Thronson with us here at the table who can she can answer questions about um, anything that's happened behind the scenes and the status of enrollments, et cetera. Thank you. Board Member Norton. I'm ready for a motion when you want one. Um, you can go ahead and make a motion. Okay. I move that the board approves R277-726 draft two on second and final reading. Okay, we have a second by board member Moss. Would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, well, the way that- Pull, um, pull your mic ahead. down. No. Pull your mic down. Um, we have some issues with SOEP funding in the smaller schools, and I appreciate the opportunity that we are taking here to begin the correction process on that. Thank you. I, I have a clarifying question um, for the motion. Are we talking about high school or high school courses? May I speak to that? Yes. Thank you. Jennifer Thronson, Director of Teaching and Learning. Uh, in the code, it says public high school. High school is also defined in the code as grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. So it, it includes junior highs with ninth grade, any school with a ninth, 10th, 11th, or 12th. <laughs> um, one more clarifying question. Um, I, I lost what it was. Public high school, um, does that include private? No. So okay. that is the distinction in the code to have public. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. Okay. Uh, board member, let me see. Lear. I just have a question about where this where this increased funding will come from. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Go ahead. We all know the answer, so we're fine. Mm -hmm. It's in a state appropriation that came this last session that was tied to that HB 417. So it was a little over $600,000. Go I ahead. Just clarify. I, I thought that there wasn't enough of that, mm -hmm. and so this is now, so we're asking for more. No. Mm -hmm. or, is that right? Yeah, separately from this process, you, as part of your funding request, business case process, that is one of the current business cases that the board has supported or approved to move forward. Um, but you'll notice in this draft three, one of the additions that we made is to make it very clear. It says subject to legislative appropriations so that okay. it sends that message to LEAs, which I will say because I've been um, in meetings where Director Thronson has 
uh, when she was sharing this information with superintendents, for example, and I'm sure there's other areas where they have, we have been sharing as, um, as USBE staff the fact that the $600 plus thousand dollars is not sufficient to cover the cost of all the students who are currently enrolled in schools with less than a thousand students. We don't have the amount, a sufficient amount to cover. But we, um, and so this language is making it very clear that at least one student, one course okay. per eligible school will be covered. But beyond that, um, it's really subject to legislative appropriations. And, and that's uh, the other language that we clarified in this draft too. So, so sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I understand. So that would be going forward for this year, literally this school year, it will be just one course per stu one student. But future years to cover this, to cover the need or to cover the want, it would have to be, there'd have to be more money for more, for additional students to take more than one class. Yes. Okay. Chair, if I may. Go ahead. So, so this is why we needed to put this in front of you from an internal control aspect, right? We can't overcommit funds. So it, it became clear to us that it wasn't clear to the field what what the current language supported. And so they, they basically over-enrolled, right? There was too, too much demand for the course load. So we had to be clear that it's one student per course subject to further appropriations that you're requesting as part of the business case process. So hopefully that helps. It's, it's a really good demonstration of the due diligence that staff take to make sure that we're implementing internal controls and ensuring that code and or rules support uh, you know, our fiduciary responsibility. So, so it was a good catch. Thank so. you. I'm just going to track back on this. So one student, one course at each school or each one, every student can take at that school can take one. So you're saying if I'm at a school, only one student in that school can take an online course. And get it paid for through these funds. They can still use their WPU route, but they would the LEA would be having to use WPU to pay for that student to participate. We only we got less than seven hundred thousand dollars for this program this past year, which allows what the superintendents wanted was to divide it equally, which allowed us to do one of the highest cost courses for one student in each school this year. <laughs> so tracking back, I, I'm and maybe because I just know too much. So <laughs> what what that means is what about a school now who has put in 10 students, are we going to tell them that nine of them cannot take that and pay through this? And, and if that's not the case, then what do we do for this school who wants to put one in and we now don't have money for that one? So we have obligated to one per school. So the funding will not, if the one has 10 and the one school has one, that school will be paid for guaranteed. If a school, I think in the rule it's March or May 1st, didn't use their funding, then those um, funding will be then distributed to the other schools that did participate to bring down their associated costs. Um, but that was the best we could do and what the superintendents agreed to so that we show that there is need to spend the full amount because it has been exhausted already. I think we're at a little over 900,000 right now of small school participation. Mm -hmm. But looking historically last year to this year, there isn't a, a big shift in usage, um, except for in one school that I'm a little worried that maybe they didn't understand that we're paying for one. We're going to reach out to them, but the rest of them are using similar usage to what they've used previous years to now. <laughs> They're just getting one student covered at this time. Thank you. I have many more questions. <laughs> Board Member Cannon. Oh, no, you're off. Uh, you, you answered oh, question. thank you. I'm sorry. Board Member Hutchings. And, and sorry if you covered this before. So it, there, one, one class per each student, what if, sorry, one, cr one credit, one student. One student. <laughs> sorry, thank you. Um, if, if 10 students don't take one of these classes, could another student take two and have, the, is, that a, is it a cumulative amount for the school and they can allocate it for their students as they wish or is it only one for one? May I respond? Go ahead. So initially it's one for one, and then at the time where they have to waive their funds if they're not going to use them. So I think we gave them it's March 1st in the roll. Um, if they don't use their funds by then, they're relinquishing those funds for us to reappropriate into LEAs that did have two students participate so that we can exhaust the funding and leverage it to pay for as many students as we can. <laughs> Thank you. Board Member Hansen. 
Yeah, I'm just looking at the rule, and I hope I'm looking. It's draft two that we're reviewing today. Um, and so 534, 535 is where we reference public high school. And my question goes back to one that was answered just a minute ago. So if there's a junior high that has a ninth grade, that would be a public high school then? Do we need to define that somewhere? Or is that, I don't, that's not commonly understood for me. But that opens up the number of schools quite a bit, depending on the structure in a, in a school district. So may I raise? I could take it if we're good. Go uh, may I respond? Uh, so we actually looked at this this morning. It's defined in the SOEP code that is referenced in the rule. So high school is in the definition section in code. If we want to include that same definition from code in our rule, we certainly could. But it is linked to the code in the rule, so that definition is in place. And maybe not as literate, like direct away, away. <laughs> okay, if, if our objective is to clear up any potential misunderstandings in interpreting this rule so that the funding could be clear, I, I guess, I don't know if we can just do that with instruction to staff, but to include a definition that says public high school is any school that includes any grade nine through 12. Is that okay, Chair, to just uh, No, I, staff, I think that's that okay. A, Does it, that match amend? statute? I thought statute was public high school 9 through 12. It's, well, high school is defined as grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. Okay, so they broke the grades up. Correct. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Scott. Jan, Angie? If you'd like, um, I could just add in the motion that uh, an amendment, if you'd like to make an amendment, that sure. um, the board amend draft 2 to add... Uh, the definition of high school means the same as that term is defined in 53F-4-501. And then I'll do that. I can put that in before we file okay, it. That'll be fine. I'll make so that Scott, motion then. Make that amendment? Yeah, that we'll amend. Do we have a second to that? Second. Okay, so the amendment is to add, Angie, can you just say it again? Yes. That the board um, amends... Uh, amend R277726 draft 2 to include a definition of high school to mean the same as that term is defined in 53F-4-501. Okay. Any more discussion to that? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Okay, so that is now amended. Okay, seeing no other... Discussion. So the motion is that the board approves R277726 draft one as draft two as amended. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chair, that, that concludes the monthly budget report on and much appreciation to the board for adding this. It, it was pretty much last minute, but you know, it is a clear message to the public. And I do want to say, especially to auditors, that we are in control of our funds and, and uh, we do our due diligence. So thank you so much for, for that opportunity. With that, ma'am, at your direction, I can proceed to the discretionary funds report, I think yeah, is 6 .3. next. 6.3, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. So, so we've teed this up. Uh, what I mean by that is the last couple of meetings, board meetings, June and then last month in August, um, I let the board members know, uh, uh, Chair Belknap, that we would be asking for an action uh, for this month's discretionary reports. Normally, it, the discretionary funds report is an information item, but we do need an action item uh, or ask a request for an action item. And what we're seeking, uh, if you'll refer to the motion or the recommended motion that we put in there, is, is basically what amounts to continuation or support from the board to continue utilizing your um, discretionary funds over, these are non-lapsing funds. Uh, they're un, unrestricted funds, except for where, you know, like federal mineral lease applies to research and development. So they're all properly allocated. Um, I do strongly recommend that the board do, does continue to set aside funding for contingency and funding for legal contingency as we've started this new year. Um, I, those amounts are, are very small uh, amounts comparatively with the budget that stays even internally here. Uh, we've had support in the past for that. Having a contingency fund and a legal contingency fund is wise. It's, it's fiscally responsible. Uh, then the other highlighted ones are, are projects that you've approved in the past uh, that 
you know, for whatever reason, procurement processes, things like that, we're continuing to do it. For, so I'll call out as an example, the $10,000 that you approved for internal control implementation, we're close to, to uh, uh, exercising or executing some of that money to purchase a, a software uh, that can help us um, uh, develop wire diagrams and further promote internal control uh, processes. Uh, so with that, ma'am, um, and with all those highlighted in yellow, um, I'll just pause here to see if there's any questions about the motion that we're seeking or the action we're seeking from the board and any of the highlighted projects. The other ones that are not highlighted are either, you know, completed or or done, we're just looking for support to, again, you know, establish or continue a contingency, legal contingency, and then the continuation of the other projects that you see highlighted in yellow. Thank you. Thank you, Scott and Deborah. Um, Vice Chair Davis. I move, that, <clears throat> I move that the board approves the continuation of the contingency and legal contingency funds and multi-year ongoing projects highlighted in yellow. We have a second. second. Second, board member Hansen. Did you want to discuss it? Oh. Seeing no lights, the motion before the board is that the board approves the continuation of the contingency and legal contingency funds and multi-year ongoing projects highlighted in yellow. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Passed unanimously. Thank you, Scott. Go ahead. Okay, uh, subject to any further questions or concerns, that concludes this portion of this agenda item for the discretionary funds report. At your direction, ma'am, I can turn it over to Sarah Howard, Howard, Howard for the uh, ESSER slash COVID relief fund update. Thank you. We'll go ahead and do that. Sarah, we're on 6.4. It looks like we're getting Sarah and Sarah. Sorry, it's not liking my code to share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> All right, it likes it now. I saw something click. All right, there we go. All right, sorry about that, thank you. Introduce yourself, please, thank yes. you. <laughs> Sarah Harward, CARES Educational Specialist. So we're here to give you our regular update on our COVID-19 relief funding for K through 12 here in the state of Utah. Um, so we're gonna be going over the regular data that we, that we go over, but a little bit quicker so that we can get to our ending of the CARES funds and an overview of our annual uh, federal report that we did. All right. Oops. Okay, so as usual, going over our COVID-19 relief funding, we do so from our initial award to our newest awards, um, both from the federal and uh, state level. And then I did uh, keep our big chart of all our awards with the amounts and the purpose just to um, reiterate the comprehensive nature of all these awards. So let's get on to our CARES funding. So this is our ESSER 1 and GEAR 1 funds that have to be spent by September 30th. So just in a couple weeks. Um, where we're at as far as reimbursement level for these funds, and this was data was pulled August 29th. Um, so for our ESSER 1 90% award, we've reimbursed 98.8%. It has gone up a little bit. We've reimbursed about 50,000 more. So we're at about almost 99%. Uh, 
For our ESSER 1 10% base, uh, we've reimbursed 95.2% as of this morning. So a little bit better than what you see on the screen. And then for our Gear 1 award, we have reimbursed 93% uh, as of this morning. So just to give you a little updated information since this deadline is quickly approaching. Then at the bottom of you, your screen, you see the number of LEAs that have been fully reimbursed. This means that they have requested the total award that they received um, for ESSER 1, the 90%, the base, and the Gear 1 award. So we have uh, a couple LEAs that have still to request a portion of their award. Uh, I wanted to, this month, give you a more graphic uh, uh, display of what those reimbursement levels look like. So as far as our ESSER 1, 90%, we're at 99% reimbursed, our 10% base, 94% reimbursed, and our gear 1, 91% reimbursed. So we're doing really well as far as getting these LEAs to the finish line with these CARES funds. And then, okay, so ending these CARES funds. So starting back in January, we started sending regular email updates to those LEAs that had remaining CARES funding. Um, just to remind them that you still have funds. This is how much you have. Please uh, spend it by September. Um, as of August 29th, you'll see how many LEAs still had funding to request for reimbursement. Um, it is a little better as of this morning. Uh, as of this morning, for our ESSER 1, 90%, we have 13 LEAs that still need to request um, reimbursement. Uh, as of this morning, temp, uh, for the ESSER 10%, three LEAs still need to request. And for our Gear 1 award, we have 36 LEAs that still need to request reimbursement. So they have until September 30th to spend the funds, so actually spend the money. So if they have like a, a teacher or a paraprofessional that they're using these funds for, and they're um, wanting that teacher to work up through September 30th, they can't request those funds until October 1st uh, because they need the funds to actually be spent. But that's okay because they do have 45 days after September 30th to request reimbursement. They can't spend the funds anymore after September 30th, but they do have 45 days to request that reimbursement. So that's their uh, little window that they can um, send in their reimbursements request. So it's okay if, if we haven't done all the reimbursements by September 30th, we have until mid-November to get all of those done. So that's it on the CARES fund. I'm gonna move on to uh, our second round of funding, uh, unless there's any questions. Okay, sounds good. Um, so round two, our CRISA awards. This is our ESSER two and our GEAR two, which we have one more year for these ones, September 30th of 2023. So here's where we're at on these awards. For the ESSER two, 90%, we've reimbursed 56% of the award. For the base, we've reimbursed 60%, and for GEAR two, 23%. And then again at the bottom, you'll see the number of LEAs that have requested their full award. So they're done with ESSER two and GEAR two. Um, so we're doing really well on those um, as well. And then moving on to ESSER 3, our American Rescue Plan, um, our ARP ESSER, and our EANS 2, which we have until September 30th of 2024. Here is our chart for this award. So the ARP ESSER 90%, we've reimbursed 72 million, which is just 13% of that award. For the base, we've reimbursed 20% of the award. And then for our summer and after school programs, the programs we had to set aside that 1% of our total award for, we've reimbursed 4% out of the summer and 8% out of the after school program. And then at the bottom again, you'll see the number of LEAs that have requested their full award. So of course, these are gonna be lower because they're requesting the first ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 first before these. All right, so that sums up our reimbursement uh, data. So what we're going to move on to now is our overview of the ESSER and GEAR annual federal report. So this is the report that we had to complete because we accepted the ESSER and GEAR awards. Um, so just a little bit overview on this report. This is data that we collected from our LEAs back in uh, spring earlier this year. What they reported on was FY21 data. So data from July 2020 through June 2021. So this is you know, older data, but still relevant. Um, and then also because we were reporting on FY21, at that point, we were only working with ESSER 1, GEAR 1, and ESSER 2. We had not uh, started working with GEAR 2 or ARP ESSER yet. So we only had to report on those three initial awards. We will re be reporting on every award come next year when we're reporting on FY22. So as we're going through this data, just keep in mind of that, we're in FY21 with just those three awards. 
Um, again, every SEA and LEA um, that received ESSER and GEAR funds was required to complete this report, and we're happy to say that all of our Utah reports were completed by uh, the deadlines. Uh, I do want to express our appreciation to our LEAs um, for completing uh, the data requests that we made of them so that we could give accurate data. Um, I know it was a lot for them, and, and I really appreciate them getting us all the information timely. And I do want to also make note that we have communicated the challenges of this data to the U.S. Department of Education. So we do hear um, those challenges, and we are communicating them. Okay, so what we're gonna go over now is the summary of the data. So we're gonna start with the ESSER 1 90% award. So this is just FY21, and what they were asked to report on was how much they spent in each of these four categories during FY21. So we've got, from left to right, addressing physical health and safety, so this is gonna be your PPE, your masks, um, all that kind of stuff. You're meeting ac ac uh, students' academic, social, and emotional needs. This is gonna include like your technology, like uh, buying computers so kids can learn at home. Uh, then you've got mental health supports and then continuity of services. So you can see that for our ESSER 1 90% award, um, how much each was spent during FY21. Uh, so uh, kind of see where that's going for that. For the ESSER 1 10% base, they asked for something a little different. They asked how many LEAs um, uh, spent funds in each category. So instead of looking at total dollars that were spent, they wanted to know how many LEAs spent in each category. So again, we're looking at FY21. Um, in total, we have 49 LEAs who received this award, and they could select that they spent in one or more categories um, that you see. And of course, if they didn't spend any funds in FY21, they did not have to answer this question. So that's um, a little background on this data. So again, same uh, categories. So the majority of our LEA is spent on physical health and safety in FY21 with these funds. And then we'll go on to the gear one fund. Um, this is the same thing. They wanted to know the number of LEAs that spent in each of these categories, but they switched up the categories for this question. They wanted to know from left to right, how many LEAs purchased educational technology in FY21? How many focused on addressing the unique needs of specific students? And this one's an important category because our governor's office did designate that these funds would go to our students at risk of academic failure and our special education students. Um, next category, we had 28 LEAs spend uh, in providing mental health services and supports, and then 26 in sanitation and minimizing the spread of infectious disease, and then 59 in extending uh, learning time opportunities. So that's how our LEAs prioritize their funding in FY21. Okay, so that's the end of all the CARES. Now, ESSER 2, 90%. So we're back to how much money did they spend in each category. Um, so I will note that, so this is FY21 data, but we did not award these funds until April of 2021. So this is money that our LEA spent between April, May, and June of 2021 um, while they're still um, uh, balancing their gear funds. And of course, you know, we would, they are spending their ESSER 1 funds before their ESSER 2. So there's just three months of data gathered for this award on how our LEA spent the funds. So again, similar categories to what we already explained. So just that's why the numbers are a little lower on that. It's just because it was just three months of data gathered. The next, so that's all the money and like number as far as categories of funding, how they spent. The next thing we were asked to report on was how much of our ESSER funds was spent on FTE? And this is all ESSER funds. So this is our ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 for Utah, because again, we did not have to report on ARP ESSER for this, for this year. So this um, includes obviously our part-time positions and it includes any staff that are fully or partially funded with ESSER funds. So we had um, ESSER funds supported over 2,100 teachers, uh, over 550 paraprofessionals, 160 support personnel, 105 special educators, uh, 26 school counselors, 24 administrative staff, and nine nurses. So again, this is just FY21. So in this year, that's how, that's where our ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 um, funds were spent on FTE. 
a little bit more on FTE, um, a little trend. So uh, our LEAs are asked to report on how many FTE they have September. They asked September 19, September 2020, and September 21. So I wanted to give you an overview of what it looked like for September 2020 to 2021. So in that year, 89 of our LEAs saw an increase in their FTE. Seven LEAs had the same number of FTE, and 58 LEAs saw a decrease in their FTE. So this really speaks to the fact that our LEAs have an opportunity to use these funds to hire additional staff, but there is a labor shortage and there is uh, a struggle in you know, hiring these additional staff. So that's where we're at on that. That is the end of the required questions that our LEAs and had to answer. Um, we did have LFA governor's office, you lead, um, ask us to include some additional questions. These were optional to our LEAs. Our LEAs did not have to answer them in the survey, but um, a little, about half of them did. Um, so I am going to report on those. So one of the questions that uh, we put in there was, did the LEA use ESSER or GEAR funding for training teachers and staff due to the needs related to COVID-19? So we had 20 of our LEAs respond yes to this, and those 20 LEAs reported spending $5.4 million on training staff uh, and teachers. So um, that was just one of the questions. There's only two for the state of Utah data. The other one was they wanted to just an optional narrative that our LEAs could write out to policymakers. That's all it said, optional narrative to policymakers. So um, about, like I said, about half of our LEAs responded and really common themes between our LEAs, mostly just gratitude for the funding um, and expressing how they've been able to use the funding. So I pulled three examples just to share with you. Um, and if it's okay, I'll read them. But uh, the first one says, our LEA used funding to pay for summer school and interventionists. Our school had more growth this year than prior years because of these interventions. The second one, fund allocations through ESSER and GEAR have been very significant in the Emory School District. Our district utilizes every resource available to provide meaningful education to the students of our communities. With the learning gaps created for students during the pandemic, the changes in instructional consistency, as well as the increased trauma that our families were subjected to, the additional funds were very much appreciated and well utilized to work to provide the necessary resources needed for students' success within our new normal. And the last one, the ESSER and GEAR funding that our LEA received was extremely useful and timely. It allowed for our school to carry on making the necessary transitions to continue to educate our students in a safe and effective manner. The funds were much appreciated. So a lot of, of these uh, narratives uh, were similar to this, just gratitude and how they were able to really utilize the funds. So this, uh, there were four questions that you lead asked us to include. Again, optional. Our LAs did not have to respond. So I just pulled some common uh uh, the tr you know highest uh, number of answers for each of these. Um, so this question was, which investments do you believe will be the most effective in meeting the current learning needs of students? These were the top answers. Technology for students and in the classroom, after, after school summer and tutoring programs, especially HVAC improvements to be able to even hold summer programs. Um, then mental health supports and investments on teachers and support staff. So these were the big investments that our LEA has really highlighted. The second question was, which investments would you describe as innovative, meaning like new to your LEA? Um, they said credit recovery programs, home visits to assist students and families, technology and hybrid lear learning opportunities, PPE and sanitization, and then summer and after school programs. The third one, um, they wanted to know, do you have any actionable rec recommendations for demographically similar, similar schools in the state? So do you have any advice for, you know, similar schools? Uh, and it was about like finding good providers for hotspots so your students can learn from home, um, utilizing trained teachers to provide interventions, um, investing in teachers and support in mental health for the entire school community is worth every effort, um, and then engaging stakeholders in school and LA planning um, each year and make those fluid, make sure to review it, uh, adjusting as you need. So that was just some of the highlights from uh, that question. And then the last one, have any, uh, have any of the new investments led to new efficiencies going forward? So one LEA said, yes, the Chromebooks we have allowed, uh, Chromebooks have allowed our personalized and competency-based learning initiative to be more productive and efficient. Another said, we were able to complete benchmark assessments in a few days rather than a few weeks. Another said, we were able to uh, get an all new online curriculum for deaf and hard of hearing. 
Another said, uh, hiring additional staff allowed us to provide smaller group instruction, which allows for greater academic support. And the last, it has opened up time for special education teachers to focus on more critical needs. So that's just a summary of all that data we collected. Um, and that uh, concludes my report, if there are any questions. Thank you, Sarah. I don't see any questions, but thank you so much for the clear and concise data. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> Board Member Moss. Sorry. I, I'm scrolling through the appendix. Thank you for all that information. The, the full data set for, that you've gathered, both the required and the optional, is that in the appendix, or is it available somewhere else that you might send a link to? It is not. Um, We're happy to provide that. Generally speaking, um, we handle data requests through our traditional data request uh, platform and portal available on our website. Um, if there was, like I said, interest from the greater community, we'd be happy to field requests through there. Um, I'd also note that this information will be going on the federal dashboard that is linked to our COVID-19 um, state level page as well. So there is transparency into this beyond the presentation. And like I said, we're happy to provide the data set to interested parties through our normal process. So for board members, is there a backdoor secret channel? <laughs> or do we have to request you know, it through you know the appropriate if you know channels. Who, if you know who to email, we're happy to share it as a large scale uh, Excel to the full board. Um, and if there's additional questions from there, I know Sarah would be happy to answer for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to point out to the board that there's, as you can imagine, there is um, great interest in how states are spending dollars. We have had one of our congressional uh, members reach out to get more information. I imagine we'll hear more and more of that. Uh, and rightfully so. There's a lot of money out there going to states. And um, Utah has been highlighted. And it, you know, I'm thinking back. It, it's almost a traumatic experience. So I'm sure it's, it's so visual in my brain of the early days back in the spring of 2020 when we hired Miss Sarah Harward to help our other Sarah uh, go through stacks of boxes and disseminate PPE to schools. And they were just buried in the basement in boxes. And here we are a couple of years later, thank heavens. And um, I just want to thank Sarah so much for her... Um, her ability and diligence in tracking all of these dollars and helping our schools and answering questions. There's a lot that comes at her daily. And because of that, uh, we really are heralded by the D Department of Education and those who are <coughs> asking for this reporting. I will say that our Sarahs have had to consult with the Department of Ed to help them work through some technical issues. We find ourselves uh, helping them help us. And, uh, and as I have spoken with the Department of Ed most recently, they continue to say, how is Utah doing this? You all are tracking well, and um, we're getting reimbursements in. And it, you know, beyond our awesomeness, it happens to be that we have good systems in place and protocols in place. And so shout out to all of those who have put grants management together, who work behind the scenes because we are, um, I think, leading out in the way that we're tracking and, and issuing reimbursement to our districts and the fact that we are uh, of note nationally. So if you have interactions with our congressional delegation, those who are seeking this information, I think we are a bit ahead of the curve because of the grants management system we have in place because of our LEAs and the, the very uh, finite reporting that we're able to gather from them and then put that up to the Fed. So thank you, Sarah, specifically both Sarahs to both of you. but. Um, Sarah Harward, thank you for the, the way that you're conducting this business so that we can report back to our congressional delegation that we've got this under control. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Sarah, so much.